and 60 update. new cases. Let's listen in. Not information overload, but we got a lot of a lot of ground to cover over the next hour. And I see we're joined here by Chris Johnston, the director of the Office of Management and Budget. Um, Chris comes from um, just about an hour ago, uh, a couple hour, few hour meeting, budget meeting, uh, where they went over a lot of uh, ground, covered a lot of ground as well. And uh, one of the topics that was discussed, um, Chris, I'll just tee this up and then I'll call on you at the tail end of, of the health reports uh, to elaborate. But uh, one of the topics was the funding for our K through 12 schools. Um, and, and just so everyone knows, I'm, I'm pleased, um, beyond relieved, but pleased to um, arrive at a position where we're in full agreement with our friends upstairs in the House and the Senate that we'll be moving forward with the current budget, which includes a $183 million increase uh, for K-12 um, spending. And again, this just shows that um, not only have uh, our K through 12 school uh, schools have been spared the knife uh, or a cut in their budgets, um, even while a global pandemic has truly washed upon our shores as it has others. Uh, but this just illustrates or underscores uh, the priority and the importance that we place at this very foundational level that we were able to arrive here and how important it has been that we have prudently uh, managed our state, fiscally speaking, um, through the good times and the tough times. And so um, this has truly been a long-standing priority here in the state of Indiana, more proof positive or, or um, facts to, to bear that out. This at the very same time, well, you'll recall, we sat here at this very table um, right out of the gate and said that we were going to every state agency and saying we need to uh, you to look under every cushion and see any spare change that fell out to the tune of almost 15 percent of your current budget uh, to give back to try to make up the shortfall in revenue that was coming into the state year to date. Um, we then, uh, as you recall, um, asked our institutions of higher education to take a haircut as well uh, to the tune of about 7 percent. And, and, and I appreciate uh, the leadership at all of our universities. Uh, world-class uh, universities. One of the, one of the, I'm not pandering, but one of the, one of the uh, greatest assets the state of Indiana has. And our um, goal throughout this whole process, navigating our way through these rocky, shallow waters, has intended on making sure that every student in K through in our K through 12 system, if they so choose, and they're passionate about um, going on to college that they have the ability to do that. So um, this was a um, collaborative effort for sure, and it's one that's taken a few weeks to make sure that we could get to this point with confidence that going forward, uh, those, those uh, over $180 million increase in this budget stays, stays intact. And uh, another um, word of appreciation to all the superintendents and all the principals, all the input that we were able to receive um, especially as, as our schools are planning well into the future. We're living in this time of somewhat uncertainty, kind of day by day, checking what the, what the score is. Are we up? Are we down? Where are we in the standings? And um, it was truly a collaborative effort from, from the local leadership to the state leadership, uh, again, in the House and the Senate, principal superintendents uh, that came together and said, look, we're, we're planning out into the future. Um, but, but we need to know what's going on right now, and I hope this uh, announcement, and Chris, you please do elaborate on this, get more into the weeds, um, relieves a little of that anxiety uh, near term. And in addition to that, the, the CARES Act dollars that came in, that over uh, $200 million to K-12 through directly, and also the Governor's Emergency Fund, that, that $61 million that we talked about a couple weeks ago that's going to help schools uh, with devices and connectivity and training um, as we approach this new normal. As July starts to unfold and we move into August and schools start to see the makeup of their enrollment. Also, um, what I think was brought up in the budget meeting as well, uh, and Chris, please do again elaborate on this, um, but I fully endorse and support and there's agreement again in the House and the Senate and leadership with uh, Dr. McCormick, 
um, the superintendent of public instruction, her recommendation in terms of funding um, the students, the enrollment students who are um, at 100 percent rather than 85 percent if they are out of the classroom uh, for COVID, COVID related um, reasons. Uh, I think that's very important as we move through again the coming months to know that there is some certainty there. So we worked very hard, all of us, to get to yes uh, on both of these fronts, and we got there. And so with that, we'll now turn over to uh, uh, a report on our leading health indicators. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, Hoosiers. Today we reported 264 additional cases of COVID-19 across the state of Indiana, which brings to our total 41,013 total number of Hoosiers known to have COVID-19. We also saw 24 additional confirmed deaths. To date, 2,289 Hoosiers have died of COVID-19, and another 186 are believed to have died from this disease based on their clinical diagnosis. Our ICU bed and ventilator capacity is holding steady with more than 38% of our ICU beds and more than 81% of our ventilators still available. We also have seen more than 371,000 Hoosiers tested for COVID-19, up from just over 320,000 a week ago. I want to clarify that any Hoosier who wants to be tested can get tested at no cost through one of our Optum Serve sites or through an ISDH drive through clinic. We've also tested nearly 73,000 people through our partnership with Optum Serve. That includes more than 20,000 long term care workers across the state. It's critical, I want you to understand that we are encouraging all staff of long-term care facilities to participate so that we can ensure that we are protecting our most vulnerable residents in the state of Indiana. It's a huge undertaking to test more than 57,000 people at 500 facilities in just three weeks. And none of this would have been possible without the support of the long-term care associations that have worked clo closely with us to ensure that all staff have the ability to get tested at their place of employment through the month of June. I'm also grateful to the Indiana National Guard for their support in this ongoing effort. I also want to alert you to a couple of changes you will see in the daily data tomorrow. The total number of tested will increase by three to 5,000 because of an additional historic negative results from a lab that just recently was onboarded to our elect, uh, electronic system. That lab had already been reporting the positive cases to us, but we've now captured their negative results as well, which gives us a better picture of testing throughout our state. I also want to update you on some other enhancements to our data dashboard. We are adding a daily test positivity rate. This will be filtered by district and by county and will give us more real-time look at how many people are testing positive. It's important to note that it takes three to five days to calculate a true positivity rate because of the way the negative results flow into our system. So you may see some spikes in positivity in the gray shaded areas that will likely change as the negative results come in. You also will see some adjustments to our hospitalization data. You will be able to track hospital bed and ventilator use day by day by region or statewide. Hospital census and admissions also will look different. This is pulled from data uh, provided by the Regan Street Institute. We're also adding additional demographic breakdowns for testing, which you will be able to filter by region and by county. We're still seeing disparities among our minority populations and continue to ensure that our drive through clinics serve these populations in areas where testing is limited. We have had a significant presence in Lake County and have tested more than 5,000 people through drive throughs and walk throughs there. We're testing free testing today through Saturday in Gary. We're also testing in Elkhart County today in response to an increase in cases in the Latino population there. We will be in Shipshawana, Topeka, and LaGrange over the next couple of days to bring additional testing to the Amish populations in those communities. As I've mentioned before, we have been seeing some increases in Northeast Indiana, specifically LaGrange and Elkhart counties. To ensure that locals had everything that they needed, Dr. Weaver, our chief medical officer for the State Department of Health, spent all day with our local elected officials, the public health personnel, and the hospital officials yesterday in this area. I wanted her to give you an update um, on her time with them and their path forward. Lindsay? 
Thank you. Good afternoon. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of visiting both Elkhart and LaGrange counties, and as Dr. Box mentioned, I was able to meet with the health departments, community partners, hospital leaders, and local officials. We have recently seen an uptick in COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in Elkhart and LaGrange counties. Elkhart has had an increase in daily testing, but the positivity rate is remaining steady at about 11.4%. In the past week, they have also seen an increase in the local hospital census, mostly secondary to COVID-19. LaGrange has had a large number of new daily cases since the end of May. The number of daily tests has increased significantly and the positivity rate has increased to around 30%. Both counties have done a tremendous job with increasing their testing. Elkhart currently has 19 testing sites and has one of the highest per capita testing rates in Indiana. The State Department of Health was able to provide to both counties education material, cloth masks for distribution to the community, thermometers, and portable oxygen monitors, which can be used for monitoring oxygen levels at home. We met with both Elkhart General and Goshen Hospital to discuss what they were seeing, and were incredibly impressed by their preparation, planning, and dedication to their community. The state is going to provide both hospitals with equipment to do in-house testing that will be in place by the end of the week. I was also able to participate in Elkhart's Latino Pandemic Response Team meeting and got to hear of the amazing work community partners have done to provide education, food, and masks to the Elkhart community. With the assistance of this team, ICH is doing a pop-up testing location from 12 to 7 today in Goshen. Additionally, we will be doing testing in Shipshawana on Thursday and Topeka and LaGrange on Friday. We encourage both counties and the surrounding communities to take precautions by following the recommended social distancing practices, such as keeping six feet apart and wearing masks in public locations. We are also working with partners in the Amish community to help share information about COVID-19 and how to prevent it so that they can receive this from a trusted source. Being able to connect with communities and see firsthand what they're doing to address the spread of COVID is critical to our efforts to reduce the number of cases. We will continue to monitor counties across the state so that when we can reach out with additional support, we are there when needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I'm so glad you got to go spend some time in those communities. And now it's my pleasure to turn this over to Dean Paul Halverson and to Dr. Nir Menakimi of the IU Fairbanks School of Public Health, who are going to provide an update on the second wave of data from our COVID-19 research study. Gentlemen. Great. Thank you, Dr. Box. It's always a pleasure to be able to work with you and, and with the governor. We really do appreciate the governor's request for our assistance in scientifically examining the SARS-CoV-2 infections with the ultimate goal of helping to inform uh, state decisions. When we're unable to test everyone, an, an alternative uh, scientifically valid approach is actually to test a random sample. When all people who were randomly selected participate, we get a valid generalizable estimate of the SARS-CoV-2 infection in the community. By taking multiple random samples across different time periods, we're able to observe how the virus is affecting Hoosiers over time. Wave one, as you may recall, occurred at the end of April and recruited more than 4,600 people, including more than 3,600 in a random sample. Wave two uh, tested people from June 3rd to June 8th and included more than 3,600 individuals, including almost 2,700 in the random sample and almost 1,000 in the supplemental outreach testing of vulnerable populations in Marion, Allen, and LaGrange counties. We had less participation in wave two, which makes it challenging sometimes to draw additional conclusions beyond what we'll be able to present today. The good news is that we're able to get a sufficient number of participants to draw some important conclusions about the status of the virus. We know that as uh, more testing becomes available in our state, uh, there will be a greater opportunity for Hoosiers to get tested and know their status, which is a very, very good thing. We have a record number of testing locations available for people with and without symptoms to detect the presence of the virus. And this is a really, really very positive step in the right direction, although, uh, parenthetically, it may reduce the interest of some people in participating in a random uh, sample testing. 
With all of that said, uh, when I reflect back on everything we've accomplished in both wave one and wave two of this study, I'm reminded about how unique our state is in the ability to mobilize this massive effort effectively uh, coordinating across multiple agencies and private organizations to support the health of Hoosiers throughout the state. Uh, Nir and I have been contacted by numerous states uh, who are planning to replicate our approach uh, with, this, uh, with this approach uh, towards random sample. Uh, many of the officials in other states were surprised by the capabilities of Indiana. In particular, our state's unique investment in data through, Indi through Indiana's management performance hub represented one of the many ways that people were very, very impressed. I'd like to thank especially Joshua, Joshua Martin, whose team seamlessly connected multiple state databases in a way that's just not possible in other places, and that was extremely valuable to this effort. While several other states are developing and executing their plans, Indiana remains the only state that has conducted random sample testing now in two waves. It's exciting to showcase what Indiana can do, and I think the results you'll hear today will be important in terms of verifying the very scientific uh, conclusions that have been drawn and the actions that have been taken. Now let me turn it over to Dr. Nir Minikemi, who's the Fairbanks Endowed Chair and leads the Department of Health Policy and Management at the IU Fairbanks School of Public Health. As the scientific lead of this study, he'll describe our findings. Nir? Thank you. On behalf of the entire team, uh, I'm pleased to provide a highlight of the preliminary results from wave two of our testing. While our results are preliminary, they delineate a number of important conclusions regarding the evolution of the COVID-19 pandemic in our state that would not have been possible without all the Hoosiers that participated. And so for that, we are very grateful and personally thank each of the participants. As before, our state estimates are derived from the random sample, while the outreach samples provide additional insights about the virus's activity in vulnerable communities. In wave two, we observed fewer active infections and a greater number of people testing positive for antibodies. Taken together, this is evidence that the virus has slowed its spread within our state because as of the first week of June, we had more people previously infected than those that were currently infected at that time. To illustrate the changes from wave one to wave two, we're gonna present the changes in active infection rates from the end of April when wave one took place to the beginning of June when wave two took place. In wave two, the statewide estimates for active infection rate was 0.6% a sharp decrease from the 1.7% observed in April. On the other hand, the estimate for antibody positivity in wave two was 1.5%, which was up from 1.1% in April. While the reasons for this could vary, a likely reason that the virus has slowed was due to our collective efforts to be safer, engage in social distancing, and reduce transmission by wearing masks and adhering to higher standards around hand and surface hygiene. This was an example of Hoosiers successfully hunkering down during the initial outbreak. Along, and along these lines, as we observed in wave one, we again observed a higher prevalence of infections among people living with someone in their household that was previously COVID-19 positive. This was seen in the random and outreach samples of wave two, and again suggests that the virus was contained to within households as opposed to across the community. The ratio between active infections and antibody positivity has improved in almost all the groups in wave two. However, we continued to see disparities among minority communities who, while improving, still show evidence of being hit harder with, the, with coronavirus infections. For non-whites, the active infection rate in wave two was 1.4%, which was lower than the 3.4% observed in wave one. Antibody positivity rates were 5.6%, which was greater than the 1.6% observed in April. The estimated Hispanic statewide uh, rate showed a similar trend with active infections coming down from 6.9% to 2.6% and antibody positivity rates increasing from one5 to 8.5%. Most of Indiana's preparedness districts followed a similar pattern with decreases in active infection rates and increases in antibody positivity rates. 
District 2, however, which includes Elkhart, uh, which we just heard about, had increases in active infection rates that we detected uh, two weeks ago when the testing occurred. Antibody rates were unchanged or increased in almost all of the districts. In Wave 2, we estimate that 43% of state residents who were currently infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus showed no symptoms. This is a rate very similar to the asymptomatic rate we reported in wave one, and a reminder that infection and spread is still possible by people who don't even know they have the virus. While the preliminary results presented today are reassuring that the virus is being managed in Indiana, we should be reminded by the experiences of other states that the virus can still be transmitted if we're not careful. After wave one, we bought some time, and I believe we capitalized upon that time in Indiana. Based on wave two preliminary results, it appears we continued to be successful in limiting the spread, but it's important to mention that we have not eliminated the risk. There are still some uncertainties, especially given the lower participation rate in wave two and the fact that our team continues to work on these analyses, but it is a good reminder that it is all of our responsibility to make sure that we adhere to any and all of the measures designed to keep transmission low. And while we might have good news today that we are managing well, it's not an opportunity to sort of relax everything we've been doing to get us to this point. Wave three will be planned for the fall and we will regroup with ISDH and the partner teams to determine the best way to optimize our testing effort at that time. Thank you. So that 43% of people that were positive and asymptomatic just underscores the importance of wearing the masks, Absolutely. right, which we've been talking yeah. about. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chris, you want to, as June 30, it's right around the corner. So you've got a lot to share as we Thank close you. the books. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Hoosiers. Uh, Chris Johnston from the Office of Management and Budget. As the governor mentioned uh, earlier today, the, the budget committee, which is made up of, uh, 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 it's a bipartisan uh, panel of legislators, uh, held their regular meeting. And uh, the purpose for, for my attendance was to uh, give a, a recap on the federal assistance, the CARES uh, legislation um, that we've benefited from. And, uh, and if anyone is interested, I, the PowerPoint for that uh, presentation is out uh, on the State Budget Agency uh, website and has a lot of information of, of the grants that we have received so far. Um, and I'll be giving uh, future uh, updates uh, at, uh, uh, at future uh, uh, budget committee meetings. But part of the discussion today uh, was dealing with uh, education and uh, the uh, reserve uh, that was set for higher ed institutions was discussed. It was a matter that uh, needed to be reviewed by the budget committee. But the uh, topic of K through 12, and we have talked about it here before, uh, has, uh, is, has been weighing on our minds uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, education uh, has been and, and will be uh, a priority, not only for the Holcomb administration, but for the, for the General Assembly. It was uh, definitely a priority in the last legislative session, a, a budget session. The annual appropriation increased $171 million from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20 and is scheduled to increase almost $183 million for fiscal year 21 to a total of over $7.5 billion. That is a cumulative increase from fiscal year 19, the last biennium of almost $500 million to K through 12 education. In the last budget session, the governor recommended and the General Assembly adopted an additional uh, investment from the general fund of $150 million to the teacher's retirement fund to help teachers, uh, teacher pay. But uh, the pandemic hit. And as we've been talking about uh, the uh, uh, revenues uh, through May, we've missed the target by $1.2 uh, billion. Uh, we think that may grow close to $2 billion by the time we close the books at June 30th. 
But at the same time, with deliberations in this office with the governor and talking about those priorities and our discussions with and primarily his discussions with the legislative leadership, we thought about those priorities long and hard for the last 30 days. And certain things are obvious. The pandemic disrupted the academic pursuits of over one million students in the state of Indiana. Secondly, schools play a central role to the character and strength of all of our communities. And the safe opening is critical to each community's success. And so as the governor mentioned, we did not want to limit resources as school co corporations must prepare and execute a productive and safe learning environment. We want the students back in the classroom. So the governor's recommended that the $183 million increase for fiscal year 21 will go forward and the tuition support appropriation will remain at $7.5 billion. So what does this mean? In addition to that increase, school corporations are receiving an additional $192 million from the CARES Act. It's distributed by a federal formula, a Title I formula, to all uh, school corporations that receive those funds. And if I may, to, I'm going to get a little bureaucratic here on you, Governor. Uh, I'm going to refer to page 760 of the CARES Act. <laughs> if you're following at home. <laughs> The, uh, but the eligible uses are very flexible for school corporations. It can be used for any activity authorized by the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It can be used for adult education, career and technical education, homelessness, uh, uh, education for uh, homeless. Prepare for and coordinate responses uh, to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. Providing principals and other school leaders with the resources necessary to address the needs uh, of their individual schools. Unique needs for low-income children or students. Improve the preparedness and response efforts of local education and agencies. And then a catch-all, uh, use number 12, all other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation of and continuity of services in local education agencies and continuing to employ existing staff of the local education agency. So we believe that the uh, funding, uh, maintaining the funding levels along with the CARES Act provide the resources needed for the schools uh, to make uh, uh, every effort to uh, open up and open up safely. And uh, additional uh, resources are through uh, our Homeland Security uh, the FEMA uh, Act um, allows for emergency funding for such things as personal protective equipment, sanitizing uh, supplies. And uh, what I understand is that over uh, 200 school corporations in Indiana have already uh, uh, filed their preliminary applications for uh, such assistance. We are working on the Governor's Education Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, that's the fund that's about $61 million, and that is focused on remote learning. Obviously, the pandemic placed uh, or identified certain needs uh, for remote learning, uh, such as devices, connectivity, and then also professional development to, in order to teach in a uh, remote learning environment. So all of these resources will be available to K through 12. I think the uh, last item that you had mentioned, Governor, was talking about, you know, how do we count the students? And as you mentioned, um, there is a formula on, on counting the students, and that's how the formula or the funds are distributed. And uh, the law uh, currently requires that um, funding for any virtual education program, uh, that if a student receives 50 percent or more of their instruction virtually, then the school corporation only receives 85% of the base funding for that student. But given that uncertainty of the COVID-19, it's very difficult uh, for a school corporation to predict and uh, how much that virtual instruction uh, each student may uh, receive over the course of the coming year. 
So as you mentioned, Superintendent uh, McCormick uh, offered a, region, a reasonable uh, approach or path forward uh, that acknowledges this difficulty, but that uh, it also needs to be uh, ratified or, or uh, actually uh, adopted uh, by legislative action when the General Assembly comes back uh, next spring. And so those will be efforts that we'll be working on um, uh, over the fall. Thank you, Chris, very much. Um, before we go to q and I thought, Dr. Bucks, you might just talk about, um, Chris mentioned how we're working with schools, and you've been out in the field connecting, physically separated, but connecting with leaders all over the state of Indiana. You want to just kind of dive into that for just a few minutes? Yeah, thanks, Governor. So we've had the pleasure of working with the Department of Education and the State Department of Health, FSSA. Um, the governor, I know, uh, all of us support very strongly the ability to get students safely back into schools this year and the importance of doing that, not just from an academic standpoint, but so that they continue the social and emotional development and also to help their mental health. And in order to do that, we work very closely to help develop the in-class document. I have had a webinar um, through the Department of Education. They ceded some of their time to me to answer a lot of questions, met with um, many of the principals on another webinar, and then our, we are actually um, hiring a liaison to the schools and we'll uh, pair them with an intervention uh, prof uh, infection specialist along with one of our epidemiologists so that we can help to support our local health departments across the state uh, throughout the school uh, year. So we're very excited about everything that's going forward and the plans that we're seeing and, and stand ready to assist um, with schools from all over the, the state. Yeah, totally a team effort. Um, everyone coming together to make sure that not only do we think students could, but should be back in a stable and safe learning environment to receive instruction. So that's what's uh, quite honestly been encouraging to see how this has all unfolded. We're trying to, I, I, I recall uh, Oscar Wilde once said that to expect the unexpected shows a thoroughly modern intellect. And so many of us have come to expect the unexpected during the last few months. And uh, th the types of actions that we're all taking and how we're being informed goes a long way for not just consumer confidence, but for parental confidence in a very important area to the future of our state. And with that, we'll go right to Q&A. Dan Klein, Wish TV. Afternoon, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, one question for the governor and one question for uh, Dr. Box. Um, governor, knowing now, you know, what you didn't know the last few months, and even with this wave two of testing, uh, what would you have done differently um, with just the handling of all this? And for Dr. Box, what's the biggest challenge for students when they go back into the classroom um, as opposed to doing virtual learning? What is, what's the biggest challenge um, for schools, for teachers, uh, and, and for making that possible? Want me to go first? Sure. So I think the biggest challenge is to um, get buy-in across the state amongst all of our schools and um, parents um, on the need to wear masks, quite frankly. I think that there's a period of time during the day when they're sitting quietly at their desk working and if everybody's desk is faced forward that individual students could certainly take their mask off. But there is a real need for masks to be worn when they're doing passing periods, going out to the bus to get on the bus to go home, when they're maybe going to the cafeteria to pick up their lunch and bring it back to their room. So that emphasis on washing their hands, wearing their masks, social distancing to the best of their ability. I mean, students go to school so they don't have to social distance, so they can be with their friends and their buddies and they can hang out and be on the playground together. So I, I think that's a huge change for them and it's gonna be difficult, but at least it will allow them to be back in school with their friends and learning academically. So I think that's probably one of the, the biggest hurdles. There are a couple really good um, studies that have come out recently that show that masks worn in communities versus masks not being worn in communities can decrease the, the risk of infection by 40 to 60 percent. So I'd be happy to provide the, those resources to anybody that would like those. Yeah, and I would just say, um, Dan, in, in terms to your first question, it, honestly, it's too early to say. I mean, I am, uh, I'll, I'll write that book maybe when I'm retired or at least have a few months on the other side of this. We are still in this. There is, there is not, uh, 
I'd be taking my eye off the ball, quite frankly, if I started to second guess or um, um, not look forward. We're trying to be very responsible and very informed um, about future steps that we take, about the, the scale and the pace of our expansion in terms of capacity testing or tracing, making sure that we can isolate, making sure that we can uh, meet a surge with our own surge if, there, um, if one comes about. Um, so too, too early to say, maybe, maybe ask me a, a few years from now. Mitch with WTIU. Good afternoon, Mitch. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I've been in contact with the State Department of Health discussing vaccination rates, and according to the Children and Hoosiers Immunization Registry Program, uh, the number of non-flu vaccinations ordered in the state fell about fell by about 47 percent in the month of April, hmm. or by more than 93,000 doses. I guess I'm kind of wondering: is the state doing anything to encourage these parents and others to come in for those mixed vac missed vaccines? And do you have any concerns about those numbers? Yeah, thank you, Mitch, for highlighting that. That has certainly been a worry, not just in the state of Indiana, but across the United States. Um, the CDC has been working with every state. We, we are well aware of those um, statistics and very concerned about them. A part of that has been a reluctance on parents' parts to bring their, their especially their under two-year-olds in to get immunized because they're so worried about them getting infected. So we've been working with the Indiana Academy of Pediatricians and the American Academy of Family Physicians um, and now again with our local health departments to make sure that people understand that we are bringing sick kids in separate from well kids and the importance of getting their kids immunized. We, we really would be heartbroken to lose children over vaccine preventable diseases in the middle of a pandemic. So we're really, really focusing on that right now. We're working with the Indiana Immunization Coalition and as I mentioned, our local health departments that also give a, a large bulk of our immunizations um, across the state. So, so thank you for highlighting that and giving me the opportunity to, to bring that up. Sherry with the Indianapolis Star. Afternoon, Sherry. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking uh, my question. I have two questions. One is for Governor Holcomb and one is for uh, the folks from the folks from Fairbanks. My question for Governor Holcomb is on the education cuts. How is the state able to to avoid that? Are the 50 percent agency cuts and seven seven percent higher ed cuts enough to offset what the projected budget gaps would be? And then my question for the um, folks from Fairbanks would be the 43% that were asymptomatic. Was that at that moment in time and did they potentially develop symptoms or did you follow up to make sure that out of, you know, that, that these asymptomatic individuals never develop symptoms? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. So the 43% of people that reported none of the symptoms uh, at the time of the study was at that time. Um, you might recall this study is not designed to follow individual people over time. It's really designed to follow subsections of the state over time. Uh, we have been talking uh, very superficially about adding on to the study to potentially follow up with the asymptomatics to see if they eventually develop symptoms. Uh, but that was not the original point. So the simple answer right now is at that time, and no, we did not follow up on anyone. Chris, you want to take the budget, how we make ends meet, and how we started with K-12 through as the number one priority and kind of played off of that in terms of the actual funding pie, so to speak? Sure. Well, I, I, I think the answer is, is that we're just, one, going to have to be very disciplined with what we've already imposed and make sure we achieve those, uh, those targets. Um, also have to look for probably a, additional cuts or things to stop doing. Some of the things that we had put on hold, such as capital projects, go through that list again and see, again, if there's things that you know, fall through uh, as far as the, the priorities there. Um, I'm not a big fan of uh, uh, hoping for additional federal assistance, but it's also thinking about this federal assistance that we do have and can we use that more uh, creatively. And then finally, if, if uh, uh, it needs to be, uh, we might have to dip into the reserves uh, just a little bit more. Yeah, and you, uh, Chris, Sherry, Chris mentions a very important point, something that we um, um, have been making our case 
uh, on a regular basis that we do need more flexibility in terms of uh, those CARES Act dollars, how we allocate those dollars. I, I should go back to, um, I think it was Dan that asked from WISH who, who asked what I would do differently, and I might, I might not agree to so many conference calls. Um, I feel like I've been zooming and on a, on a phone um, nonstop for, for uh, months on end, but um, always learn something, and actually those calls give us an opportunity, whether it's with my gubernatorial cohorts around the country, um, both sides of the aisle, uh, to make our case about the importance of this federal funding and the need of more flexibility and um, sustainability, quite frankly. We're learning a ton during all this about things that we need to do long term, that we were forced uh, to do um, over the last few months. Uh, we're making that case as well. I talked to Dr. Or Director Carroll yesterday in Washington about uh, with Dr. Sullivan and Doug Hunsinger, and we talked about how telemedicine has kind of changed as a good alternative, and we don't want some of the federal uh, actions that have taken place over the last few months to go away post-pandemic, whenever that might be. And so we are um, planning in every way, both financially to make the budget work, but we started, Sherry, to answer your question directly, we started with a pie, and this, it, Chris says, he's, hope's not a strategy, but um, we, are, we are tactically putting in place these decisions um, that will help us also grow out of this. I said very early on that we wanted to be smart. We wanted to take our medicine at the, at the outset, and it might not taste good going down, but the actions that we took early clearly to date have been paying off. It, uh, every single one of the 2,200 lives that we've lost, it does not get easier hearing your report and seeing the report every day. Um, but those actions that we took early on have made a difference and have put us in a position, I think, uh, to continue to be able to focus on lives and livelihood and getting back to work and getting back to school. And so um, uh, the, all, those, all those factor into, Sherry, um, how the budget ultimately comes into um, place and going into next year's budget. Emma Kate Chalkbeat. Hello, Emma. Good afternoon. Hi, Governor. Um, I wanted to confirm, I think uh, Chris Johnson mentioned the promise that you made in January um, to free up some money using the state surplus in order to uh, hopefully increase uh, uh, teacher salaries. So is that something that is still on the table or is that done? And then a second question, since you since you just kind of mentioned it, what what, if anything, um, does this mean for the budget conversation that we'll be starting in January um, as far as schools budgets? We'll, we'll cross the January bridge when we get to January. Um, but uh, obviously what the next half of the year, look, we'll close the books Jan June 30th and first half of the year will be behind us. We're, um, I'm optimistic about uh, our economic development fronts. We just had a second quarter Indiana Economic Development Corporation board meeting today um, and got updates on all the deals that we've been kind of head down and, and working underneath the surface of the water. So we haven't suspended our activity in terms of, of uh, promoting the state of Indiana for, place, for places to grow all throughout our state. I'm encouraged about that activity um, when we get on the other side of this. And, and uh, in terms of, and, and, and you bring up a good point, Emma, and I think, Chris, you actually corrected me um, and I'll stand by your figure or your recollection, not mine, but I think I said 214 million to schools from the CARES Act, and you said 192, so that's, Emma, I didn't want you to think I made another promise. Um, but I think... Uh, so it, so the, the distribution is 214 million. The one, uh, the component that goes out by the Title I formula is 192. There's an additional 10 percent that uh, the IDOE uh, can uh, uh, allocate according to their uh, priorities and uh, the, based on need. Uh, regarding the, the contributions to the retirement funds, I was not speaking to what we discussed uh, what seems like a decade ago uh, at, the, at the close of the books in 2019. Uh, my reference was to $150 million that was actually deposited during the last budget session 
to the 19, or excuse me, to the teachers' retirement fund. What we were hoping to do uh, last summer, and that was back when we were closing the books with 2.3 billion dollars and actually expecting growth up to like 2.7 billion dollars, is uh, using the 250 million to make a similar deposit to the pre-1996 pension plan, <clears throat> excuse me, which then would free up other money to possibly look uh, for a contribution to uh, K through 12 and help, help uh, teacher salaries. But with the current, <clears throat> excuse me, with the current situation, um, the, the 7.5 billion uh, expected fiscal year 21 appropriation is the, is the best we're gonna be able to do this time period. And then uh, just as a final note, because of that, the one thing that we will be following is obviously the economic impact on our revenues. And so when we do a revenue forecast this September, an updated forecast, there'll be another one in, in December before the General Assembly comes back to construct a budget. One of the things that I would uh, caution the, the school corporations is to use the money that we've got to plan several years down the road that, that uh, the funding that we, we are providing uh, is to take care of current needs, but also not to overcommit because we don't know what the economy is gonna look like and we don't know what uh, constraints might be placed on the budget uh, when we put that together next spring. And that future, we don't know what that future federal funding might look right. like in terms of that 214 million or 90, 192, yep. Steve with KPC Media. Afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon, how are you guys doing today? Doing good, yourself? Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, two questions, a, a quick one for Dr. Menachemi. Uh, did you have an update on the uh, total statewide exposure rate uh, mm -hmm. and an updated mortality rate? I know we had that last time and I don't wanna just add new numbers to old numbers because that's not exactly how this works. So I didn't know if you updated uh, that. Uh, and then my second question for uh, Governor Holcomb and, and Dr. Box, uh, after LaGrange County issued a countywide mask mandate on Monday to try to control their rise in cases, uh, we polled our, our Facebook followers here in Northeast Indiana and asked them, do you wear a face mask, uh, cloth or otherwise, when you go out in public? Uh, with more than 1,800 responses as of this afternoon, 56% of people said no, they don't wear a mask. Uh, your response to those findings. Yes, thank you for the uh, question. So in terms of updated numbers, we did not yet calculate those exactly in the same way that we did last time, in part because of some of the concerns with the lower participation rate. And so uh, as Dr. Halverson mentioned, what we wanted to do was focus today on the things that we are sure of and some of the ratios between the uh, current infection rates to the previous infection rates uh, were something we were more sure of to be able to present. We are planning to do as much as we can with the data we have, um, and so stay tuned for uh, more information on that. As it pertains to the mortality rates, we couldn't calculate the updated mortality rates for the reasons that I just said, but we have continued to do much more sophisticated mortality calculations based on the wave one data, and we will soon be sharing those as well. Um, I don't think there will be anything particularly shocking there, but uh, as you age, the risk of mortality from infection increases significantly. Up until now, we know that as you age, the risk of mortality from being a case increases significantly, um, and we'll be able to have more precise details about that sophisticated analysis soon. Sure. So that data, I've seen data like that. I've seen um, data that the schools have sent out surveying their parents that where their parents have said if, you know, masks are required in school that 20 or 30 percent will not send their, their children to school. And, and my only comment is that's incredibly discouraging because that is the way we just, we don't have the medications yet. We don't have the vaccine yet. What we have are those non-therapeutic interventions, wearing of your mask, social, social distancing, you know, cleaning your hands on a regular basis. And again, the young population is not likely the population to get overly sick from this and may have no to mild symptoms at times, but realistically, it is the other individuals that you're wearing that mask to protect. Steve, did I, did I hear you correctly? You, you talked about the 56% who don't wear a mask when outdoors. 
Yes, when we just said when out in public, um, yeah. you know, I, I hope our, our readers would take that as, you know, the general guidelines of, of when sure. you're supposed to be wearing a mask. Uh, we didn't, it wasn't super specific, but yes, just out in public, 56% uh, said no, they don't wear a mask. Yeah, so I, I would just caution, um, not because I like polling, but I, I would just, I would caution on open-ended questions like that that can be perceived by different people differently. So we know that the spread uh, it, the, the, is, is um, more intense the closer you are in confined areas for longer periods of time. And as Dr. Box has said in the past, if you're out riding your bike on a trail out in a state park at, at uh, Pokagon or, or Brown County or you pick it, McCormick's Creek, Turkey Run, you pick it, um, you're outdoors and, and you're safe. Or if you're with your family and you're walking around the block and it's only you and you stay away, you're more than six feet away from people, uh, but you're out in public. But now if you're in a confined space for hours on end and you're around people who, and you're not wearing a mask or they're not wearing a mask and people are sneezing or yelling or singing or shouting, laughing, laughing this, I mean, the facts are the facts. And so, you know, um, we all have to make our own decisions but they have consequences. And so if you're in one of those areas, the odds go up if you're not wearing a mask as you get closer and closer for longer periods of time. Brandon Smith, Indiana Public Broadcasting. Good afternoon, Brandon. Afternoon, Governor and Dr. Fox. Um, I have a couple questions, uh, so bear with me, please. Um, so health benefits are a huge expense for schools and staff and are even more critical given, of course, the reopening guidance and the exposure risks for older teachers and staff. So what protections or additional resources is Indiana putting in place to assist schools that serve the most vulnerable or at-risk communities, uh, specifically those communities with large populations of black Hoosiers that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19? Did you say you had another one? Uh, yeah, my other one. Um, so those of us who were listening to the state budget committee uh, meeting today heard that the revenue shortfall for the, the next one. fiscal year that starts on July 1st is expected to be about $2 billion. And the reserves that we will have left should only be able to backfill about $1 billion of that. So if you're talking about a $1 billion shortfall for which we have no reserves to backfill and you're taking half of the state budget, in education funding off the table for cuts, how deep are the cuts going to have to be to make up that shortfall? Chris is running, not walking <laughs> to the podium. Uh, uh, to address your second question, then maybe Dr. Box or, or Katie, you might want to um, step forward on the um, first question. Uh, uh, Brandon, the uh, uh, Outlook for the rest of the, the, the biennium is really just going to be um, looking at the, uh, uh, at, at, as I mentioned, executing the, uh, the reversions uh, and the spending targets that we've got. Um, also looking at the, the flexibility uh, potential uh, for the, the federal uh, legislation and uh, uh, really just ad adhering to that discipline. and. Uh, um, monitoring the, the uh, revenue forecast as it comes in. Katie, did you get the first half? Yeah. Katie Jenner, Senior Education Advisor for Governor Holcomb, and I appreciate that you said I get the first half uh, because certainly there's the education side to this question, and then there's also the very important health and safety side uh, to this question. Um, so it's it's been incredible the number of district leaders, school leaders who have reached out to um, our team, who've reached out to the health department or their local health department to think through this exact uh, challenge. I think today um, with the announcement that, that K-12 funding will be whole um, and that increases there and then also the CARES money will be really important in thinking about th this strategically, whether it's through uh, the, the PPE or um, the other uh, idea that we've, we've heard from districts is that they might be strategic in, um, in how that teacher who may be at risk uh, would serve um, in, in the school year this year. So for example, they could um, be the teacher who serves students remotely. 
uh, might be one example. And Dr. Box, you, this is such a health medical question as well. I know you've had so many questions from superintendents and district leaders as they think through some local solution and ideas. We stand ready to be a partner, but let's hand it over to the expert on the medical side. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. So when we look at this, it, it comes down to ju doing just what Katie said, and that is uh, reinventing the wheel a little bit, thinking outside the box. How can we make this the safest we possibly can for our most vulnerable populations? Um, and that includes teachers, faculty, staff, administrators, everyone. We talked about things like putting up um, plexiglass barriers for the uh, secretaries that are meeting the public and decreasing the number of individuals that were in the schools and, and um, moving uh, classrooms into larger areas or even outside um, using more video conferencing, uh, especially for teachers that may be at higher risk. Um, but it comes down to, you know, making sure that all schools and individuals um, have masks and, and the ability to do that. And so the state is working with DOE to provide masks, uh, at least an initial start for that. Um, and I think also the importance of uh, further education in our most disparate and highest risk populations and education that really resonates with that population we're working on very closely. Um, and then that ability to make sure that we can test everyone who is sick and make sure we can test any close personal contacts and help them to quarantine and help them to isolate and continuing to really pound home the education that children that are sick, faculty that are sick, staff that are sick, teachers, no one should come sick to school. Meredith with WLFI. Afternoon, Meredith. Good afternoon, Governor. I have a couple of questions for you. So my first one is in regards to education. So you mentioned that you have been in contact with several local principals, superintendents. Um, what have they said is going to be the biggest hurdle that they have to jump when it comes to returning to in-class instruction as far as fiscally and just in general getting a plan together? And then my second question is in regards um, to how COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted uh, minority communities, we're still seeing it impact minority communities. How does the state plan on using the data that it's found from the Fairbanks study of how much it's disproportionately impacted people um, on providing better health care for minorities? Um, I know that there's a summer study session that's focused on this. Is this something that's going to be brought up there? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll take the first one and then maybe you both want to chime in and Katie as well on the second and Katie you might want to chime in on the first one as well but I mean in all of my conversations uh, Meredith it, it I mean if I had to narrow it down to a theme or a couple themes it's um, first and foremost the unknown factors the unknown uh, number of students who will return the um, um, and how that then could affect their budget. That's one reason we wanted to make sure well before July that school corporations, all of them across the state, knew uh, of, the, of the commitment, that increase to $7.5 billion going into, this, um, going into this year, the second half of this year, uh, was in place so they could plan accordingly, uh, especially in light of knowing of all the other cuts that have and are taking place. Uh, wanted to make sure that that came out. So I think that was the, the chief or the main concern was just the unknown and the ability to, to plan um, right around the corner in, in July and then in turn making sure that they could make ends meet financially as well and serve the students that would be coming back. Um, also, and I think this goes kind of hand in glove with what Dr. Box and Dr. McCormick and um, Dr. Sullivan, the whole team has been um, partnering up with school districts to make sure that they have a sound understanding of what makes a safe environment. Our, our goal has always been to make sure that schools were a stable, financially as well, but stable and safe environment of which to be um, instructed. And, and, I, and uh, addressing those two main themes I think has gone a long way or should go a long way. Katie. So it's interesting that you, where you started, the, the word I wrote on my page immediately and what we're hearing a lot from our local districts is the uncertainty. Um, our school district leaders across the state are thinking about a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, and they're thinking about the health and safety side, but the other piece that 
Um, I think sometimes we forget that they are very aware of is, is our ball that we run, to use a sports analogy, our ball that we run is student learning. And so how can we in the health and safety plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, ensure that we are doing everything possible to maximize the student learning, uh, regardless of whether they are being taught face-to-face -face in a blended learning environment or in um, an online or virtual environment. And then you mentioned the third piece, which is fiscal. And again, that um, announcement today was helpful. So when I look at the prevalence data, I, and I'm sure that Nir will have more to say about this, but in our non-white population, the antibodies were only positive still in 5.6% of individuals. There's still a lot of individuals out there in our African-American population that have not been infected, and that's why we need to underscore the importance of getting people into testing, of continuing to talk to them about social distancing when they can, always wearing masks, washing their hands, making sure that we are actually getting to the communities that need to hear this message and offering the testing at sites that are convenient for them, at sites that are comfortable for them, um, and at sites um, that they can get to easily. A lot of our um, African-American population and our Latino population are in a, many of our essential jobs. And so they really have to continue to go to work as, as some other individuals and cannot work remotely from home. So consequently, infection rates are higher. Nero, I'll, I'll let you add yeah, in. Uh, you took a lot of what I was going to say. Uh, you know, lumping everyone who's disproportionately affected into one category for the why is probably not wise. On the one hand, yes, Hispanics, African Americans have been hit harder by this. And I know the health department and we are here to help also figure out why so that what we do is targeted at it. If it's because people are in, more likely to be in essential businesses, that's one thing. If it's because they live in family structures that include a lot more people than the nuclear family in smaller and confined spaces, that's another thing. If it's because of things going on, as an example, uh, in the Amish community, that's another thing. So there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Right now we're working on figuring out how to minimize the risk for as many people as possible. And as Dr. Bach said, there's some generic things that works for everyone. We're now getting to the specific things to work in targeted communities. Thank you for joining today's. All right, there you go. You've been listening to Governor Eric Holcomb giving us an update on the coronavirus pandemic across our state. The governor announcing that uh, no cuts will be made to uh, the school systems across the state for the upcoming school year. That's what's happening here in central Indiana. Right now, though, we want to take you to Atlanta, where they are announcing charges against the police officers involved in a deadly shooting over the weekend. Let's listen in. Examined and possessed the two tasers that were used. Um, we have also had an opportunity to examine the taser log.